in the middle of a series, and we are asking a very simple question in this series. Here's the question. What makes you happy? We're all asking anyway, so we thought we'd spend a few weeks talking about it as a church. We began this series last week, and if you weren't here, here's what we learned. We learned that the pursuit of holiness is the path to happiness. The pursuit of holiness, the pursuit of God, is the path to a better, happier life. Now, again, if you weren't here last week, I mean, I encourage you at some point this week, visit this website, go to wellspringchurch.tv slash what makes you happy, and, and check it out because we spent a lot of time talking about it. But again, where we're going to pick up today is where we left off last week, that we truly do believe that the pursuit of holiness is the path to happiness. And like last week, if you, if you missed it, we didn't even just look at what God says about it when we talk about holy, because whenever I hear holy, I think of God. We actually spent a good amount of our time looking at science. Um, so, uh, psychologists have studied this, uh, positive psychology, and, and it turns out that they have discovered that the exact pathways to happiness are the very principles and the very things that the God of the universe has been saying that we should do all along. It's almost like he actually created us. And that he knows what works. But we'll, we'll talk about that a little later. Um, because here, here's the deal. If you weren't here last week, I know this phrase, pursuit of holiness is the path to happiness. You have, you have to push back a little bit. I know if you were here last week, and maybe you spent an entire week thinking about this and trying to process it, and, and maybe you still push back a little bit as well. So that's what we're going to pick up today. I want to talk about this because, because I'm convinced that, that when we think about the word holy, you know, that sometimes we have some wrong views and some wrong opinions. I know I do. Maybe you do. Because if you've been thinking about this this, this week, I bet you there's been a, a common line of thinking that keeps coming back. And when you try to wrestle with this and you try to, get, to wrap your brain around this idea that, that holy is going to make you happy and all that kind of stuff, that there, there's a tension, there's a problem that we have to resolve today, okay? And here's the tension. The tension is, is that when we hear holy, we think that equals rules. And so... The problem that you can have and that I can have and that we all have when it comes to religion in general or, or God specifically, we, we, we have this idea that, well, holy equals rules, and there's no way that rules are going to actually lead to my happiness. Because when we all think about happy, typically we think about a lack of rules. You know, we think, I would really be happy when I could just do whatever I wanted. You can say it this way, holy equals rules, but for us we think freedom equals happy. Freedom to do whatever we want. Just freedom to eat what we want. Freedom to drink what we want. Freedom to drive how we want. Freedom to spend what we want. We just think that is the, that is the ultimate. Ultimate freedom would lead to ultimate happiness, you know. And so, so anytime you start talking about this idea of pursuing God, we have this natural tendency to think, okay, well, that means I'm going to have to follow rules. I'm not going to get to do what I want. And there's no way that that's going to make me happy. And I understand that. I understand you feel that way. Lots of people feel that way. I'm sure I felt that way from time to time. But, but I want to kind of press into this idea for just a moment that ultimate freedom would really make us happy. That the key to life is just being able to follow every impulse we have. Because it turns out there's a moment in life where we are free to follow any impulse we have. And that's when we're born. When we're babies and we are infants, we don't know any rules. We don't have any boundaries. We know nothing. We are free to do whatever we want. And like we talked about last week, all the parents in the room, I'm sure you loved your kids. But did you allow your infants to just do whatever they wanted? No, you read a book, and a book gave you a system to make them better. 
and you read a book, and your friend read a book, and you, you didn't like the books, and you fought about the book. We're not going to talk about the book right now. But every single parent of an infant almost immediately starts doing everything humanly possible to teach them to stop doing whatever they want and to sleep when we want them to sleep and to eat when we want them to eat and to go to the bathroom when we want them to go to the bathroom and eventually where we want them to go to the bathroom. So, so infants, again, you're, you're born totally free, totally free. And immediately the world starts trying to say, well, okay, I get your impulses, but we want you to do this and do that. It would be really better for everybody if you do that. And so, but that's infants. So I'm sure by the time that they're toddlers, since freedom is happiness and ultimate freedom is doing whatever you wanted, by the time they're toddlers, we, let, we just let them do whatever they want, right? No. Because they still, they don't understand things. They don't know things are dangerous. They don't know what to eat. They don't know what to, to drink. And so we have to continue to give them rules and boundaries and parameters. But again, surely by the time they're in elementary school, and surely by the time they're going to school, and they're all, surely then they're old enough to just do whatever they want. That's why none of your kids have bedtimes, right? None of them, because you love them and you want, you want to be free. You know, they can have soft drinks whenever they want, right? Right? Midnight, you want a Dr. Pepper? Have at it. Yeah, no, 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 because you know, even, even as an elementary age kid, that, you know, sometimes there are things that they want to do that's not really the best for them, so we have to protect them, we have to give them boundaries. You know, my kids, they want red food dye, my wife is like, no. If my children ever commit a crime, don't commit a crime. If they ever commit a crime, my wife's going to be on television. They had red food dye. I don't know what happened. I'm so sorry. That's her excuse for it. Everything. But again, elementary age kids, right? They have these impulses. They want to do these things. They want to stay up late. They want to eat this. They want to do this. And we say, no, you can't do that. Not because we don't love them, but because it's not, it's not good for them. But clearly, if ultimate freedom is the ultimate happiness, uh, listen, by the time you are a teenager, clearly you can do whatever you know. No, that's a bad one. Okay, so college, post-college, young adult. Clearly young adults. Young adults, this is now a time, right, where you're free to follow your impulses. You are now free to just do whatever you want because there are no consequences. You know, there's no such thing as debt. Just spend on that credit card. Nothing ever happens. Show up to work whenever you want. Your boss is cool. Wait, well, no, no, no. Sometimes your impulses are wrong even then, and they get you in trouble. Okay, so when are we actually free to follow our impulses? And when will that actually make us happy? Is it when we're married with kids? Nope, there are still consequences for bad choice. Is it when we're retired? When is this mythical moment when you have learned enough and achieved enough and everything's great to where you are just free to do whatever you want to do and whatever you think will make you happy and follow every impulse? Because from my perspective, when I look at some of people's greatest results, I mean greatest regrets, most disastrous decisions of their life, I guarantee you, they thought they were following their impulses to be happy. Do you really think the spouse planned to ruin their marriage? Do you really think that spouse planned to blow the family up and see the kids once every other week? No, of course not. But don't you think when they were making the decisions that led them to that destination that they felt free? And that they felt convinced that this will make me happy. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I don't want anybody asking me any questions. I am free. What about the person that steals from work? Do you think when they steal from work, they steal thinking, man, I can't wait to get arrested and go to jail for the rest of my life. <laughs> Don't you think they think that this is a free choice and this choice is going to make life better and I don't need anybody telling me what to do because I deserve this and I've earned this? Don't you think it's because they believe that freedom equals happy? They don't want anybody stopping them from doing what they want to do. They are free to make their own choices. See, it's interesting, because there actually is a nugget of truth in what we believe. Because the truth is this, freedom does equal happiness. The problem is that we don't understand, 
that we are not free. There's a reason when God sent his son, and when Jesus was on the earth, Jesus talked about coming to set us free. Because he knew something we don't, that we are not. And so what I would love to do today is to do the best I can to make it very clear to you that, that those impulses, those desires, those things you have that you think you want to follow, that think you will lead to freedom, are not helpful. They are not good. They are not for you. And they do not, never have, never will lead to freedom. Freedom is found in a Savior. But we'll get to all that. What I want to do is I want to turn to a man we turn to a lot here at Wellspring. A man named Paul. Paul was a church leader, church pastor. He would start churches. He would give instructions to those churches. He would write them letters. We have those letters now. We read them almost 2,000 years later. And what we believe as Christians is that when Paul was writing these letters, God was speaking through Paul's pen. And so we can read these letters, and we know what God wants us to do in our life and how he wants us to live our life. And in Paul's letter to the church at Galatia, he addresses this very issue. He addresses this idea of how to live happy, how to be happy. But he addresses the idea that we have something going on inside of us that is sabotaging us, something that is broken, something that is telling us, do this and it'll work. Do this, it'll make you happy. Do this and it'll set you free. And it's never worked. And so Paul comes and he says, hey, I've discovered this guy named Jesus. I'm going to tell you all about him because he can actually fix that problem. That freedom you're searching for, he can provide it. He can set you free. Now, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. So we're going to be Galatians 5. It's not, it's going to be up here on the screen. Because here's how Paul begins this passage to me and to you and to all of us who wrestle with this idea is that we think holy equals rules and that freedom equals happy. And so we don't want rules in our life. We want to be free to do whatever we want. Here's his response, starting in verse 16. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. If you were here last week, this is exactly what Jesus said. When Jesus said, what's the first and greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. Follow God. That's what Paul's saying. Paul's just simply talking about it in a way that we can understand a little clearer. He says, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Live. See, we believe, we believe in something called the Trinity. God the, whole, God the Father who is in heaven, he's what you think of, or like the beard, whatever. I don't know if he has a beard, but that's what you think of as God the Father. Then there's God the Son, Jesus. He's a real person who really lived. He really is in heaven right now, hanging out with God the Father. And then we believe in God the Holy Spirit, which is literally the way he communicates with us here and now. When you're sitting in this room and when you hear something in it, you kind of feel it, touch your heart, and you have a thought about, hey, I should change this in my life. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Whenever you're out in public, whenever you're, you're about to do something, whenever you're about to have a fight with one of your kids or with your wife, and that little voice says, don't say that, that's the Holy Spirit, and you should listen <laughs> because he is helpful. <laughs> that's God. And what Paul is saying is he's saying, hey, let God guide your life. Let him be in charge. This is a direct rebuttal of what we think. See, we think that holy equals rules. We think it's a checklist. And okay, I've got my contract for the day, so fine, God, I'll be holy. I'll just obey this contract. And Paul's like, no, 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 no. It's so much better than that. It's not these cold rules. Holy is a relationship. Holy means you get to be reconnected with your heavenly Father, with the God of the universe, with His Son, with His Holy Spirit. He wants to wrap His arms around you. He wants to love you. He wants to hug you. He wants to protect you. He wants to take your hand and walk through life together and say, hey, okay, coming up, we have a, we have a pothole here. This is a pothole that I discuss in the book of Romans. And what I say we should do is go left around the pothole, and everything will be better. Okay? So let's go left. I, I know you want to go in the pothole, but let's not do it. Let's go, let's go around. It's like with your little kids, and they want to jump in the puddles. Please don't jump in the puddles. Please don't jump in the puddles. 
That's what God is saying. He's saying, let's go back to the verse. He says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Let the God of the universe step into your day-to-day, moment-by-moment life and walk you through it. Now listen, here's here's the offer. This is a God so loving that he gave his son for you. This is a God so powerful that he breathed and the world was created. This is a God so powerful that he was able to bring his son back to life. This is a God who knows everything, an all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful being who's saying to you, I want to walk with you every day of your life to help you avoid guilt, shame, pain, and regret and to produce the best life possible for you, your family, and everyone you know. What do you say? That's the offer. That's the offer of Jesus. And we believe that's the path to happy. We as Christians, we as Wellspring. And the reason we push back on that is because we think, well, why do I need to be told what to do? Well, why do I need a God? I'm smart. I, I, I should be able to do whatever I want. I should be free to follow any impulse. And Paul explains why that doesn't quite work. See, he says, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. That sounds rough, doesn't it? It's like, Paul, I'm not sure who you think you're talking to here. I'm sorry, Paul, are you you saying I have a, a sinful nature? Like, are you saying that it is a natural instinct in me to want to sin against God, to want to rebel against God, to want to do what God has want me to do? Is that what you're saying? Paul would say, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Well, Paul, how do you know? Um, Because I've lived life. Have you? Have you lived life? Remember the things we all just talked about and how on the front end you really thought that would work and you thought you were just being free and you thought this decision, I want to be selfish or I want to do this or I want to do that and I deserve this and it'll be great. Remember on the back end how all you have is guilt, shame, pain, and regret and you give anything to have a time machine to go back and avoid that? That's how I know you have a sinful nature. Because on the front end you thought that was a good idea. In fact, you thought it was a great idea. You thought doing that was the key to everything. And you're wrong. And God knows you're wrong. And God loves you. So he sent his son to fix it. But before we fix it, let's really understand the nature of the problem. Because Paul's not done. That's what he says. He says, the sinful nature wants to do evil. Now this is very important. Not sort of bad things, not gray things, evil things harmful things, destructive things. And these things are just the opposite of what the Spirit wants, God, in your life. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. So, in fact, what Paul is saying is that cartoons nailed it. Remember cartoons, when they would have to make a decision, like the angel would pop up and the demon would pop up, and they kind of talk to each other in the ear? Nailed it! That's what Paul's saying. He said, hey, as you go through life, this is going to happen. And then he says this. Then he said, just to to really brighten your Sunday morning, he adds this. He says, says, these two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you're not free to carry out your good intentions. They're constantly fighting. This isn't even something you can solve. This isn't even something you can win. It's not like you stay a Christian 10 years and you never have bad desires anymore. He's saying, no, 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 they are constantly fighting with each other. Here's what he means. He means for the rest of your life, When you become aware this is happening, and when you become aware of the fact that God has something to say in your life, but your sinful nature is speaking, our sinful nature is actually dictated and spoken into by a sinner, the sinner of all sinners, means named Satan, the devil, Beelzebub, whatever you want to call him. I know you don't like talking about Satan. You're like, do you really believe in Satan? I really do believe in Satan because he's awful, and he hates your guts, and I've experienced what he does. And what he's saying is, once you realize what I'm saying here, you're going to walk through the rest of your life fully and freely understanding, maybe for the first time. Hey, these desires in me, these things in me, anything that goes against what God wants for my life, I've got to identify. This is my sinful nature. This is sin. This is trying to harm me. This is trying to do evil. This is trying to destroy me. Why on earth would I listen to it? 
Why on earth would I listen or follow anything that is trying to harm me? Does any adult in this room think that your children should be free to follow their desires to taste the Drano? It looks so good. I don't care. So that's what Paul's saying. And he's just trying to lovingly say, hey, 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 I, I get it. Nobody likes being told what to do. You were born that way. Everybody thinks they're smarter than other people. You were born that way too. But here's what I need you to understand. That is dangerous. That is a sinful nature. And that is a sinful nature whose sole premise and goal is to do evil to you, to harm you, to hurt you, to ruin your life, and to ruin the lives of everyone you know. So please, please, please let the Holy Spirit guide your life. Don't be guided by your own nature. Because your nature is broken. That's what Paul would say. And hey, don't beat yourself up about it. You're going to have this fight forever. You're going to have this fight. Well, actually not forever. You're going to have this fight as long as you live on this earth. You'll be set free from it in heaven. But until then, don't feel bad that you feel tempted. Because that is normal, natural. That is part of the process. They are constantly fighting with each other. But you get to choose which one you listen to. You get to choose which one you give more power in your life. You get to choose which voice sounds, sounds greater. You get to choose who has more influence in your life. You get to make that choice is what Paul says. And look, we want the best for you, so why not listen to the voice who wants good for you and not the voice that wants to destroy you? That's what Paul is trying to say. And you want to push back and you say, are you really saying that I want to destroy myself? Well, no. I'm saying you've been lied to by a liar who hates your guts and has tricked you. Well, how do I know? How do I know? Well, you can read God's word and you can see. No, but how do I really know? And Paul says, okay, okay. How do you really know? How do you really know which voice you're listening to? It's very simple. You look at the results in your life. And if it's working, if it's making your life better, it's a good voice. But if it's not, quit fooling yourself into believing that it's going to get better. And then Paul gives us a list. Paul says, okay, here, here's how you can know. Here's how you can know which one you're following. And he says this. He says, look, he says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. In other words, if any of these things exist in your life, you are following your sinful nature. The nature that wants to do evil, the nature that wants to harm you. And here's the list, and it's not an exhaustive list, by the way. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Now, some of you look at that list and you think, oh, well, I would never. Some of you look at some things on that list, I would never. Some of you look at some things on the list and goes, I call that Friday. But see, this is how it works. This is how your sinful nature works, and this is how Satan works. Because again, I'm not polling anyone. You don't have to raise your hand. But some of you, you look at some of the things on that list, and you're like, well, that's, they're not that bad. And in fact, they're, they're kind of fine on the front end. And that's the problem with sin. That's the problem with your sinful nature. It can produce momentary pleasure, but a lifetime of pain. And what God is trying to say is, hey, I, I want better for you than that. Because, if we, let's be honest, there's nothing on that list, nothing on that list that you look back on from the other side of the activity and think, good decision. Glad I did that. Proud of that. Hope somebody filmed that and puts it on Facebook. I hope my kids see that. I hope my parents see that. Man, I hope that, that in, in 20 years other people hold that up as an example of how to live life. Not a one. But you didn't think that going in. You thought that going in. You're going, yeah, woo! 
I am free to do whatever I want. This is going to be great. Free to live a lifetime of pain, guilt, shame, and regret. That is what Satan does to us when we follow our sinful nature. And he's good at it. He tricks us. And he traps us. <laughs> it's a lot like fishing. How many fishermen do we have in the room? Anybody like to fish? Uh, the fish will be happy to hear that. <laughs> I love to fish. I'm not good at it, but I really enjoy it. Uh, I, like the, I like the rhythm of it. I like, the, I like the piece of it. But I'm really bad. Like, pretty much I can put a cricket on a hook, throw it in the water. That's about it. Like, if I ever start using lures or anything like that, I swear the second I throw it in, all the fish laugh. They're like, hey, this is an idiot trying to catch us with a lure. Like, because I can't think like a fish. I have no idea how to reel and how to bob and how to do things like that. Like, I just can't do it. Like, they literally put it out on fish book. Do not follow this guy. Like, don't bite this hook, you know? And, and I know it's me because I've got, a, I've got a really good friend. His name's Jake. He's an amazing fisherman. And there have been times we've been fishing the same pond, the same location, and I'll be sitting here using a rod and run a lure, and I'll get nothing. And I'll be like, it's broken. And Jake will be like, hand it to me. And he'll do it, and he catches fish immediately. You know, and it's because he knows what he's doing. He he knows how he, he knows how to do it. He knows how to trick trick the fish, which is great. Now, there's all different ways you can fish. You can use live bait. You can use you can use lures. Now, maybe again, if you're not a fisherman, that's fine. But but there's a specific lure I want to talk about today because because it works really well. It's called a rooster tail. Maybe you've seen it. It's called it's called a rooster tail, and this is a very very popular lure because look at it. It just looks awesome, right? Like I would eat that. I'm in. You know, it's super colorful, and, uh, but, but really, like, 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 so this part right here, it's really colorful, and it attracts the fish's attention. This metal, it shines really well in the water so they can see it. This little bit right here, when you reel it in, it actually kind of vibrates in the water so it gets the fish's attention, kind of soothes them, and it makes, it makes them feel great, you know? Now, maybe you don't notice this or not. There are hooks right here. See these hooks? I mean, they're hidden, but there's hooks. There, 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 there's all these hooks because, because again, don't, 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 don't miss me. The point of a lure is to trick a fish into taking a bite. It's to make a trip fish feel totally safe, totally at ease, and just come up, and not even a little bite. You want a big bite. And then you set the hook. And so when we fish and when we design fishing lures and we do all these things, we try to think like a fish. And we try to think, what do they want? What can we trick them into believing is going to make them happy? What can we trick them into believing is totally safe for them? And when we're in the water, how can we, how can we activate that lure in just a way to where it mimics something that is good and safe so that we can trick that fish into giving up? It's life. Now, again, I'm not knocking fishing. I like fishing. But if you understand the concept of fishing and tricking and hooking, you understand what Satan does to you every day. He tries to make it look appealing. And he tries to make it look safe. And he tries to make it look satisfying. And he hides the hook. And he conceals it. And it's shiny. And it's this object. And he says, just come take a bite. Don't let anybody tell you you can't take this bite. Your parents don't know what they're talking about. You should take this bite. Your pastor doesn't know what he's talking about. You should take this bite. You'd be so happy if you take this bite. It'll be so great. And so you do. And he hooks you. And he reels you in. And here's what he does. Satan doesn't even keep you. Satan practices catch and release. Because he wants to do it again. He wants to pull you out of the water. He wants to show you off to your friends and your family how dumb you are. Look what I made him do. Look at the dummy. He, he, he took a bite of the lure. It was a rubber worm. He thought it was a real worm. And he drops you back in the water. He looks at his friends and he says, watch this. I can do it again. (laughs) 
That was the, all right. Because see, he, he wants to keep embarrassing you. He wants to keep ruining you because he's a sore loser. He knows he's lost. He's lost. God wins. So he just wants to ruin your life here and now over and over and over and over again. So he hides, he conceals, he lies, he cheats, he does whatever he can to tell you that your heavenly father is holding out on you and that your heavenly father doesn't want the best for you. And if you don't believe me, just take a bite. And Paul says, why on earth would you continue to listen? To a liar. Why wouldn't you let the Holy Spirit be your guide? Because when you do, look what happens. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in us. Produces. Doesn't say work for. Doesn't say earn. Doesn't say eventually you'll get there. Says, when you invite me in, when you choose to follow me, I go to work. I actively start tackling your heart and your emotions. And I begin to work and I begin to produce this fruit in you. What is the fruit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Can we not all agree that that sure sounds like happiness to us? And Paul says, it's freely available. You don't even have to work for it. Just, just, just believe your Heavenly Father. Just invite Him in. Just choose to follow Him. Choose to follow Him instead of a liar who hates your guts and wants to destroy you. And if you need a test case, look back on everything you regret in your life. Look back on everything you're ashamed of in your life. Look back on everything you love to change in your life. And we realize every single time was caused by you believing and falling for a lie. What if you didn't have to do that? What if you could go forward better? What if you could go forward with Jesus? What if you could go forward with a relationship with Him? Because here's what we know. The pursuit of holiness really is the path to happiness. It really is. But holiness isn't about rules. Holiness is about a relationship. So when you think about pursuing that holiness and, and pursuing better in your life, put away the rules, put away the distractions, put it away and no, I can't do that. And remember this. Holiness isn't a pursuit of rules. It's the pursuit of a person. It's the pursuit of your loving, heavenly Father. It is inviting Jesus into your life to hold your hand, to walk with you through life, to celebrate with you when you are happy, to weep with you when you are sad, to comfort you when nothing else can, and to point out, okay, up here, you see this lure? You see that? I know it, man, it looks good, doesn't it? It looks shiny, but if you look real close, you see the hook? You see that? Yeah, we don't, we don't want that. We don't want that. Yeah, yeah you, you see this? You see, yeah, actually, you see this? There's no hooks. I know it's confusing. There's no hooks here. Th this is for me. This is good. Enjoy it. Taste it. Yeah, it's good. Taste it. I, I promise. I, I got your back. Ta go ahead. Taste. See, it was good, right? No regret, right? No shame? Yeah, it was better. Yeah, now, now, this one, nope. Now, shit. <laughs> oh, this is a new one. Yeah, but again, if you look real close, see the line there? You see the hook there? Buddy, I love you. I love you too much to let you do that. I, I don't want you to. I don't want you to get trapped again. That's what Jesus offers. And that's why we think you should take it up on it. Because it's better. It's not better because I say so. It's not better because Paul says so. It's better because you know so. You know, sometimes your impulses are right, sometimes they're wrong. 
And you know the biggest regrets you have in your life started with wrong impulses. So why not? Why not try it a different way? Why not try it God's way? Why not say, all right, I, I, I'll give this a couple weeks. What's the worst that happened? I lose a couple weeks. Think about that. A couple of weeks of losing, doing what you want to do all the time for a lifetime of understanding God's way is better. But the choice is up to you. Now, for some of you, this just means a step of obedience. You're Christians, and you're wrestling in some areas, and, and God's got you. He's going to comfort you, and he's going to walk you to the next step. But for some in the room today, you need to begin the relationship. You, you need to take the very first step. You need to take Jesus' hand that he's offering. You need to take it. You need to invite him in. And you need to begin walking with him for the rest of your life. And if that's you today, I want to give you an opportunity to make that decision right now. So I ask everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes. And if you would say yes, today is the day I want to, I want to take a step. I want to invite Jesus in. Just pray these words in your heart as I pray them out loud. Just say, say God, I need your help. God, I want you to guide my life. God, I admit that I've done things on my own, and I admit I've made mistakes. I admit I've sinned. But God, I believe that you paid the price for me. God, I believe that you sacrificed your son for my sin, and I believe you brought him back to life. That's a picture that you could bring me back to life too. So God, I commit my life to you in this moment. I take hold of your hand. I invite you in. I want to follow you. I want you to be my guide. I want you to protect me. I want you to push me towards holy. And I want you to produce happy in my life. Now I want you to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed because I have something I'd like you to do. For some of you today, you prayed that prayer and we believe your life has changed forever. We want to give you a quick opportunity, just not many people looking around, but just as an opportunity to publicly proclaim what's happened and to thank God for it. So I'm going to count to three. And when I do, I want you to raise your hand as high as you can. Just kind of imagine you're raising your hand towards God as a way of saying thank you for what he's done and reaching out to him and asking him to walk with you every day of your life. One, two, three. Shoot them up. Just keep them up. Raise those hands. Amen, amen, amen. Keep them up. Keep them up. Keep them up. Point them. Raise them high. Reach out to his heavenly father. Jesus is reaching his hand down to you. He wants to take your hand. He wants to walk with you every step of the way. He wants to protect you. He wants to guide you. He wants to keep you safe. Just reach out to him. Keep those hands up. Just thank him for who he is. Thank him for what he's done. Thank you for rescuing you. Thank you for setting you free. Amen. Amen. Okay. You can take your hands down. Now I want you to look at me real quick. And the chair back in front of you, from the front row underneath you, there's a card. And that card says, I raised my hand. Now what? If you raise your hand with me today, take that card home with you. This is not the end of a journey. This is the beginning of a new life. And remember we said it's a new life where you are constantly at battle, constantly at war. We want to be your church. We want to come along beside you. We want to strengthen you. We want to help you understand who God is. We want to help it be easier for you to follow God in your life. We want to give you the courage to take those steps. So if you take that card for me, there's some information in there about your next steps. There's a way for you to fill out that card. There's a way for you to talk to us about it. I know for some of you today, you want to talk to somebody about this decision or maybe something else. Maybe there's a step of obedience you need to take. When we pray today, our prayer team will be down front as they are every week. They would love nothing more than to celebrate with you, to pray with you, to answer your questions, and to help you figure out how to take that step towards God. Take that step towards holy on your journey towards happy. Look, I don't know what your step is today, but I know you have one. And I know taking it is better. Because everything God has ever done has been for our good. So whatever step it is, take it. I'm going to pray. We're going to close with a song. And as we sing this last song, I just pray that you will let this message settle in your hearts so that you don't leave it in this room. Don't leave it in here. Live it out there. Let this truth change you today, tomorrow, and for the rest of your lives. It's in your son's name. Jesus, we love you so much. Jesus, I thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you've done. I thank you for freedom. I thank you for the freedom that comes from following you. 
the freedom of avoiding Satan's traps and tricks. A freedom of a life free from guilt, shame, and regret. That is freedom, and we thank you for it. Father, as we pursue it, will you produce it? Will you give us a taste for it so that we will never desire anything else but your best for our life? It's in your son's name we pray.